Mike, you have some uh, fun stuff for us tonight? Sure. Uh, my my job's easy tonight um, because I'll just be turning it over. But let me just go over the the uh, list of articles for you. Um, today, conservation did pull two articles that they had. They'll be on the fall uh, warrant. So really, there's eight articles, and the first three are just placeholders. There's nothing right now on those three prior year bills, Article 1, separation expense, Article 2, and Article 3, um, collective bargaining agreements. Those are all placeholders. So really, what you have um, tonight is the zoning articles, and I know that um, Paul is on tonight to talk about articles four and five and edc will be talking about articles six seven and eight so all right does anybody have a time constraint or should we just start with paul and if i could just say one thing mr chairman just, just a reminder on your timeline that the uh, warrant with recommendations needs to be posted August 20th. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, Paul, you want to run us through your two articles? Sure. And, and, and Chair, if you'd like, I can, you know, go through rather quickly. Um, you, you've seen these uh, a couple of times, uh, uh, most recently prior to the, uh, the Springtown meeting. And I guess yeah. I would just defer to you all if you want me. I have a presentation you've actually seen before. I could go through it again, or uh, if you want, I could just uh, be available to answer any questions. Okay, which article are we starting with? I believe that is the article on the village center, the village center core uh, zoning uh, district. It's article four zoning um, bylaw amendment, village center core zoning district. Okay. Um, well, um, I think I'm going to recommend, seeing that we have two new members, that we probably go through this, you know, abbreviated presentation, just so we're all on the same page. If that works. Paul? Oh, uh, it, it uh, it's uh, the board's uh, choosing what they would like to do. I have something queued up. I can go through it quickly. Yep, I I go through it just for the new member. Okay, let me share the screen then. And uh, again, I want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Paul Di Giuseppe. I'm the uh, the director of planning and economic development. And uh, this this application or uh, this warrant article that you see. Uh, uh, it, it, it stems out of a, a, a vision plan that we did for the village center uh, over a year ago, and the plan itself looked at how, how you know uh, how this area could become you know transform into something a bit different than what we have now, uh, and uh, to, to create more public gathering places and uh, more places for people to walk and so forth. So one of the things that came out of that plan was a, uh, a tool to help actually make this happen, which is the zoning for an article that you have in front of you. Uh, I, I do want to start by saying that uh, this, the, the language that you have in front of you has actually been, has not changed since February. Uh, we had uh, worked as a, at the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals had a subcommittee that started meeting in January to refine language that we then brought to the full planning board back in January, February. They further refined it. That was the warrant language that was originally submitted. And that's the language we have today. So uh, 
So I'll just go through this. There's actually two components to this. This is actually the, the, uh, the new language that we would add in the zoning bylaw, as well as applying this on the ground, uh, this, applying this new category on the ground. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started here. So, uh, so I should just point out here that um, I mentioned there's two, two things, two changes that we're proposing. And again, they're proposing to try to achieve a more vibrant, walkable destination for our village center. Uh, it's a place where uh, you, you think about people gathering, particularly outside. So if you've seen Bog Iron recently, um, that's sort of the intent of what, what some of the things that we're trying to do is see more people there and have more of a presence there. Um, so here is where we're proposing it. It essentially runs from the Village Green down to the Honeydew on 123. This is this is West Main Street. So we have Village Green here, Honeydew here. Uh, this is the property just to the west of the L Middle School. So this is the 60 West Main. This is where that Cumberland Farms has been proposed. And it comes back up, and here's some of the wheat properties here. So that's just the context of where, if this new category is passed, where it would be applied. So it's a very limited area. Uh, just want to go through this real quick, get uh, just to look at what we have currently. Of course, this was uh, pre-construction uh, for the, uh, the sewer, so we don't see any of those photos, but. Uh, so what we have here is that this is an area that really is built for cars to go through, but it's a, it's a lot more challenging if you're trying to walk or, or bike. Um, it, and it's also an area where we have a lot of great businesses, but uh, for the most part, you don't have an opportunity to really stay there. It's more that you, other than, you know, with the exception of, say, a Wendell's or a Bog Iron, it's mostly just drive in, get your what you purchased and go. Um, and it's just... You know, not many opportunities to gather. I mean, we have the senior center and, and you know, places like uh, bagels and cream and house and pizza. But um, so the village center is just trying to take this new district, this village center core district, is just tr looking at what we have now and seeing how we can make some changes and, and really uh, enhance upon the benefit, you know the good things in the area and build off of those. So I just want to spend a little time talking about the difference between this new district and what's actually on the ground, which is village commercial. And the biggest difference in terms of the uses allowed is that village commercial, the existing category, allows a lot more uses than the village center core. And it primarily focuses on uh, the village center core is focusing on uses that promote more walkability and gathering, whereas village commercial allows that and uses that are auto-oriented, auto which in many areas of town works fine, but if this is an area where you're trying to create more of a destination, there are uses there you, you know, we probably don't want to see there. Um, and you can see on this list here what's allowed in one category and not allowed in the other, but I think you'll see the differences and along the lines of creating a more uh, walkable place. And uh, I know you had questions before about, so what happens to the, there are about two or three uses there now that if this were passed, they would become what we call, call non-conforming uses. So the good news is those uses would continue as is. They can continue to operate unless they ceased operations for uh, two years or more, and then they would revert, they, the use would have to, or the use on the property would have to align with the new district. And then any significant expansions of those businesses would have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a variance. But there's only about two or three properties that this would affect. Uh, in addition to height, I mean, in addition to the uses, the other aspect of zoning districts is what we call the dimensional use aspects of it so so what's the height what are the setbacks so whereas whereas with uses the village center core is more restrictive than village commercial when it comes to the dimensions it's a bit a little bit more uh, permissible 
So it, it allows one, one extra story, for, for example. Uh, the, 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 the uh, lot size, it, it, it's reduced, for, you know, versus the minimum lot size requirements for village commercial is as high as 18, well, it's 18,000 square feet and higher, whereas this is 5,000 square feet or, or 10, depending on the, um, the, the, the use. So what this means is it, it, it would give more allowances for developments to go forward versus what's under village commercial. Um, so we're trying to get, you know, more building in, not significantly more, uh, well, that's a subjective term, but not twice as much, you know, it's just, uh, what we think is, is in line with, with that area. And then another big difference between the two categories is the village center core adds public amenities as requirements. So when something comes in and it gets reviewed, the, we have extra requirements there to, with the focus of, of putting those amenities in place that are appropriate for people who want to walk and dine there. Uh, so you're looking at building standards that really focus on what goes on between the building and the street. Uh, we have, we put in that stormwater requirements would still have to be met, but rather than just a, a big, big pond, they have to do more than that. It has to be more of an amenity that, such as you see these ponds where people can gather around and enjoy them. Uh, that's what we're seeking to do. Uh, uh, I think the other big component of this is parking. Uh, again, what matters a lot with trying to create a place, a destination like this is what goes on between the building and, and the street. So parking is a big aspect of that. And so what we're requiring under this new district is to make parking, basically put the building closer to the street and put parking behind it or to the rear of it. Um, there are a couple of few properties. There are four properties that are zoned residential 60 that were proposed in to rezone. Um, and as you might imagine, that there are some pretty, you know, these are the more significant differences. But two of these sites were located because they're right across from, uh, they're on Mansfield Avenue across from the Village Green. And the thought behind rezoning these properties is to, uh, to allow uses that might help enliven the village green. Uh, the third lot is the village green itself, and it's only there, I should say, we're not proposing to do any development with it. It's going to stay as a park. We really just had to do this because it's, uh, because of uh, state law that talks about something called spot zoning. You don't want to create a gap between the same types of zoning di districts. So uh, we left that in there, but I want to reiterate that there's no intention to do anything other than keep it as a park. And then the fourth lot is located right behind Bog Iron Brewing, which is talked about using that lot, obtain, purchasing that lot and using it for parking. Um, and the, the, yeah, obviously there are big differences between these two districts. Residential 60 is primarily a, a, a single family use versus the village center core. As you can imagine, there, there are differences in the, uh, the dimensions from height and lot size. Again, we're really looking at three properties to along a, a busy corridor. And then these are just some examples of what we're trying to achieve with it. Uh, when you look at that top picture here, you see here's the street and then you see the parking or the building way back here and you just have separated by parking, not much in the way of amenities, whereas below, the building has been moved closer to the street, you have more street trees, you have a, a, looks like a plaza here, you move parking to the, to the, you know, to the side and to the rear. Again, this is more, this is about creating a, a pedestrian experience that our village commercial just doesn't do. So here are just some examples that I took around right around the, the area. This is from Easton. This is their main street. And you can just get a sense of what the scale is and what we're trying to, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I took these photos during the winter. It was before COVID, but uh, these photos don't have people in them because it was, I took them probably December, January, which was not a time to go out and take pictures of 
people oriented places, but uh, this is an example in uh, Pasco, Rhode Island, of a, of a you know of a mixed use building where you have this is a brewery on the bottom and residential above. In fact, uh, the city, the town actually worked to get this project built, and, and the residential above is actually affordable housing in this in this example. And then here's one from School Street in Foxborough. Uh, this is just shown, to, you know, as an example of what can happen around a, a green. So, uh, you know, if you go around the traffic circle, this green actually has a lot of people throughout the year. And then here's just an example of you set a building back. There are things you can do to make it a more enjoyable and attractive experience. And again, here is the area where we're proposing to apply this new district. Um, this went through the adoption process. It, uh, as I mentioned, we went through a, a, a subcommittee and then the planning board back in J uh, January and February. They did look at it. Uh, they were going to, we were prepared to bring it to them in April to make the original May 18th town meeting and then uh, when things were pushed back, they did review it back in May. Uh, the planning board uh, did recommend for it. And uh, we are just uh, anticipating uh, going on August 29th to town meeting. So I know I've gone through that very quickly, uh, but if you all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. Mr. Chairman? Peter? Um, Paul, um, do you... Through all this, this discussion, you're talking about having more pedestrian area. Are there concerns? I mean, 123 in that section, I mean, 123 is really busy. I mean, we see it with the schools in the morning. Sure. About having that, is, is, is a congested corridor like that really conducive to having a walking area? I'm just wondering if you thought the Yeah, it, it, it can. Um, you know, obviously, I, I hear what you're saying. It would be better, but the way Norton has been designed, you know, has developed. This was it, and it's the center. Um, but you certainly can have places that have more traffic and still create, uh, you know, a place where people still like to go and gather. Yeah, I mean, to that point, Paul, I would say, Pete, take a look at Route 16 through the center of Wellesley. It doesn't get much more congested than that, and they've got some super high-end stores all over Wellesley. that road. Yeah. It's Wellesley, though. Well, it's Wellesley, but hey, there's all kinds of places to park, and you pay yeah. to park, and you go in, and you do your thing. And you always pay to park, or else you're going to get a ticket. <laughs> so, Even if you're running in for three minutes. From experience? <laughs> yeah. It was a close one. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the, you know, one of the challenges of this with, in, in Norton is, we just don't have many streets, right? We have two two main highways that run through it. And so because of that, businesses are going to go where the traffic is. Um, so, you know, we would have to, I think one of the benefits, though, that putting those public amenities in with the traffic, you will have more trees. So the idea is that if, if it's designed right, it should actually slow that traffic down, although Let's assume things are going to pick up once the construction's done. Uh, but, you know, the benefit of having all that traffic is, is they'll see businesses. And a lot of times people will be willing to pull off up if they're driving by and they see something that's of interest to them. Paul, oh, um, when it comes to the public amenities, you know, like I saw the, the trees and the walkways and I'm assuming park benches, things like that. Who would be responsible for maintaining all those uh, spaces? Uh, the property owner, the uh, the property owner would. Okay, so yeah, so the town has no um, liability or responsibility for for any of that. No, it's like any private. This would all be private development. I mean, what we put in our right of way, the town would maintain, but all of these would be things inside the property line. Paul. Thank you. Uh, along those same lines, um, would there be any additional cost to the town to convert to this village commercial? Meaning, I know sidewalks are there, but can't think of any micro 
in trees if they're on the sidewalk, but anything else that potentially could add a cost to the town? Uh, it wouldn't be because of this this new district. Uh, this would be, I would say, in fact, helping us because any new project that would come in after approval, the, the developer would be responsible for putting those amenities in and maintaining them. Okay, so so part of the planning part of this would be all these amenities would be on the property itself, not on the common, like on the other side of the sidewalk. If you will. I know the streets right. there, but on the side, okay. Right, so like this illustration I think is a good one. So if there were a new development to come in in this area, all of this, you know, this, see I'll bring the cursor down, this would be the, where my cursor is, is the roadway. That would be the sidewalk, and then anything inside of that, that's the responsibility of, of, the, of the developer to build that. Mr. Chairman? That? Paul, can you go back to slide 26, please? Um, okay, I'm not, I don't, I didn't number these. Uh, On the top, it says, uh, if you look out on the top, Right there, that's the one there. Okay, sure. So, cur so currently, most of these, about, I would say 80% or better of these properties are currently occupied by a certain business. So yes. So let's say I go and I decide to buy, uh, I don't know, Wendell's Pub, for example, and I want to renovate it. I mean, it's non-conforming based on this. So basically, you're saying you have to demolish it at that point? No, no, no. no. Wendell's, is, Wendell's would be conforming. And if you're only talking about a renovation, that wouldn't trigger this. This is when you start to redevelop a site. So you're right that most of these lots are developed. So it would really be when they start to tear them down and redevelop it. Or if they had, a, you know, they were adding a new development. But if it's a renovation of an existing building, it, it wouldn't trigger. It wouldn't trigger the, uh, this. It wouldn't trigger the need to meet these requirements. So to, to see uh, any effect of this, rezoning would take decades if not centuries it's not going to happen overnight and you know but that's been a concern when we brought this to the public that people thought that means as soon as this gets adopted it's going to happen it'll look like downtown easton it's not and, and easton took years so we had a couple of things going on that helped drive this too right we have the sewer going in which is a you know that's a big incentive for for properties to either redevelop or expand. But a lot of these buildings are still fairly, you know, recent and in good shape. And I, I wouldn't foresee a, a significant change in any time soon. But, um, you know, there are build, buildings that might end up because of the sewer going in. And then, you know, if this is rezoned on top of it, you could see some changes. So you're saying under this, if I'm a business owner on the stretch and I want to do a renovation for a small addition, I would not be handcuffed by this. Yeah, I mean, it I guess it would depend on the size of that renovation, but if it were a small amount, no, no. And if, if you're staying within your footprint now, no, it wouldn't trigger it. Okay, Amen. So, Paul, th thanks for all your work here. Um, you know, this, this updated presentation, I still have the same, um, I guess I have the, the same inability to see what this would look like, given that all these properties are existing and tenanted for the most part. The only thing I can think of is uh, the 128 uh, train station in Westwood, which was industrial for the longest time, and then they they couldn't make it as industrial, so they tore it all down. And now it's becoming quite the center with housing, retail, yeah. and you know, similar to what I think you're trying to get here, but I I. Don't see it here, but that's me. Well, um, what we're trying to do is create the opportunity for it. 
that's really the intent. I mean, the rezoning itself, the bigger trigger, I think, is the, is the sewer going in. We just want to see if, if something does come in because of it. We'd like to have a, a, better, a better standard than what's on the ground now. Mr. Chairman? Aaron? Hey. Um, so let me help you. Uh, let, let me help you with the, uh, your vision here. Um, think about how much Norton has changed in the last 50 years with these guidelines. Think of what Norton becomes over the next 50 years, because right? I, I do think like that's the timeline, right? Like this isn't this isn't something that like as Peter says, this isn't something that happens. Or as Paul says, this isn't something that happens tomorrow. This is right. going to trickle over time, but with these rules in place, you know, you may look back and say, well, okay, because we put that in place 50 years ago, now we have this, what has become over a length of time, a nice walkable, lovely little town center. But it is a, you know, you know, it's, it's a trickle. And I think of, yeah. you know, a 50 year change that, um, well, 50, I don't know. If I'm lucky enough to still be around, uh, it'll be lovely. There are other okay. things that we will that we will want that you know we're going to try to do too. Uh, fortunately, the state has been pretty uh, good about issuing funds for projects, small projects for areas like this. In fact, because of COVID, now Mass DOT has a grant um, that we actually apply for not here but elsewhere. But they they have a grant called the Shared Streets Grant, which you can the towns can apply for to help put. Um, picnic tables, benches, planters, and the goal this year was to help create more outdoor spaces for businesses throughout the state. Uh, my understanding is they're going to continue that grant you know, through next year. But uh, my point is, we're you know, in addition to this, there are other avenues we can take to help you know make this area more, even more attractive. Uh, if, if grant funds are available for us to use and do some pretty simple and cost-effective things like putting in benches and, you know, even putting in uh, uh, bike racks and amenities like that. And if we can get it, you know, with the state's help or, or, or you know, if there's a nonprofit out there, we're trying to make contacts with, with you know, charitable groups to help us out too. Mr. Chairman? Yeah? Um, so, uh, Paul, so is is it my impression that the actually the one business that would be able to take advantage of fairly quickly would be Bog Iron? They're going to get that lot in the back by rezoning. Is that, is that safe to say? They could. They could. I know they've been trying to expand. Uh, so they, they certainly could. And again, I use them as an example of what they're doing now in response to COVID that I hope they keep that outdoor seating permanent. Uh, you know, hopefully they make some, you know, other improvements to it. But I think it's encouraging to see when you go by there that there are people out there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what we're trying to do is activate that street more. And I think they, they could certainly be, uh, in line to benefit from this. Mr. Chairman? Amy? I have a question about um, a budding parcel. So, Paul, I'm just looking yeah. at the map, and like for example, the one that jumps right out at me is um, the one that's numbered 42, kind of along Taunton Avenue, that last one, as okay. you're heading, I think it's south on Taunton Ave. Yeah. Um, if someone were to purchase that parcel and then also purchase the parcel that's labeled as 44, would they be able to build on that combined footprint and would they be required to comply with the village center requirements or would they be back to the village commercial? Well, uh, 44 is in, is not in the new district, the proposed district. Right. So they would have to, if they wanted to take advantage of the village center core, they would have to seek a rezoning to that. So they could, but they wouldn't be able to, uh, as proposed, as we have it, as we have the uh, Warren article 
uh, drafted. But they would have to they would have to get an, a rezoning approved through through uh, through town meeting. Okay. So Paul, uh, I don't I'm I'm getting my my um, meeting confused between sewer and rezoning. Have have all the impacted businesses kind of been you know queried as to hey does it make a difference hey do you care you know anything like that? Uh, well, for the I, I can't speak for the sewer project, but I we we did uh, one of the steps we we took that went beyond our requirements was when we were first drafting this we sent we sent postcards out to all of the properties within this area telling them you know we were proposing to uh, rezone and we had posted this you know the, the warrant language on on our website on the planning board website for people to see it um, I haven't heard from a local business from any business in this area about concerns for it I can't say that uh, you know the owner at Bog Iron was supportive of it I've talked with uh, the owner at um, at Norton House you know he, he was fine with it um, I'm trying to think who else I had spoken with I've spoken with uh, Miss Dooley, who owns the two houses on the corner, she was okay with changing it. Uh, I'd spoken, I should say too, we'd spoken with Wheaton. They own a number of these properties and uh, their response was they don't object to it. Uh, they were okay with the changes as proposed. And I should say that when we were developing that village center plan a couple of years ago, Wheaton was one of the stakeholders uh, involved in so we have quite a few properties represented that seem to be okay with with the change. Mr. Chairman, Dave. So Paul, I was just curious. So at the at the annual town meeting, this came back. The recommendation was to refer it back to committee for further education of the the townspeople. Can you give me a quick overview, executive summary of? What additional information we've passed on to the townspeople since that time? Well, the, the, the review, I mean, the returning both of the zoning bylaw was strictly at, at the advice of town council and the direction, I believe, of this, uh, the board of selectmen that because of COVID, they only wanted the uh, items, the, the critical items, the budget items to go to the town meeting in late June. Um, but what town council advised us was the vote to refer back to, to committee uh, would only require to go back since the board themselves had already voted on it that uh, as long as within six months that we brought it back to town meeting that we wouldn't have to bring it back to, to, the, uh, to the planning board for an additional uh, public hearing. But along with that I should say we have uh, up, updated through our social media, uh, putting information out. Uh, we're in the process of trying to do a, uh, a Zoom uh, video uh, with the planning board, a few members of the planning board to explain this that I hope we will get done by uh, either this week or early next week and then get that out on, on uh, the media center and then through our social media as well. Mr. Chairman, that uh, Paul, what happens under this with the uh, residential properties, the Dooley property, uh, the parcel number three, as you had yep. here, and even and even the church, the historical uh, society places that are here. I mean, yep. what happens? How does this fall uh, uh, account for that? Well, they can they can continue to to operate as is. Again, it wouldn't be this doesn't change their ability to keep uh, going forward unless. Uh, you know, operations cease, but the church might be a different story. So, uh, but what about like a Dooley property that's residential yeah. and that parcel number three next to it? That's some kind of historic house. Uh, so that's the library. Those? That's the old library. Yeah. Correct. So those, I mean, the intent behind that, behind the rezoning, again, those, well, Miss Dooley's property could remain 
as residential, but as you know, those property that property has been uh, for sale for a couple of years. It's possible that you know that could result in a change of use there. I mean, it could be you know, I look at that, that property and I go, wow, what a what an opportunity for something like a, a restaurant. Um, but if it's sold as residential and it continued, it can continue. As well. But can it be torn down because it's historical? Is that even allowed? Both well, they'd have to go through the historic district commi uh, uh, district commission to do it. So they would have that that um, uh, committee to have to that they would have to go through in order to get an approval. Any further questions? Yeah, I got a question. Um, I, 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 I was, I was there, I was there this morning waiting for the bus, watching the people, watching the film going on. Right? Okay. Um, well, if there are no more uh, questions from FinCom members, um, does anybody want to make a motion? I'm happy to. Can I confirm that this is Article 5? Because there's, I just want to make sure I'm moving the right article. Article 4. Article 4. All right. There's a lot of articles in here with zoning stuff. So. All right. Mr. Chairman, I move Amy? that we vote to approve Article 4 as presented in the special town meeting warrant. I'll second. This is Aaron. Okay. We have a motion and a second to recommend Article 4 as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we can go to the vote. Amy? Yes. I should back up. Who's taking minutes? I am. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> I thought that was the keyboard I was hearing. You didn't ask anybody, so about five minutes in, I was like, I guess I should write some things down. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you're yes. Aaron? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Mike? Yes. Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Zach? Yes. Kevin? Yes. I don't see it, but I guess I'll vote yes. All right, Paul, next. The, the next article is Article 5, Paul, the map amendment. So well, that's one of the things we've also covered. So. Again, two new like members. If there's a short, you know, five minutes, what are we doing? That would be great. I think what Paul's saying, Mr. Chairman, is um, he already covered it tonight um, when he okay. showed you the parcels. Okay. Yeah, so you, you had a two for there. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mike? Yeah, yeah, I, we, we just basically outlined the whole map, so I just um, recommend, I uh, movie recommend Article 5. Second. 
have a motion and a second to recommend Article 5 as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Go to the vote. Amy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Mike? Yes. Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Matt? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And I'm a yes. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right, Mike, what, what's next? Article 6, and this is a zoning bylaw amendment also, and um, I think the EDC would like to speak on this. I'd second that, Bill. <laughs> okay. So, Bill, I, I know that we presented and you guys actually voted on this twice, um, but for the benefit of the new members, you want me to follow a similar format? Yeah, if you have a quick and dirty what we're doing. Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll give a little bit of history, too, to help. Okay. <clears throat> so, thank you again for having uh, having me here to present the uh, marijuana bylaw and overlay district. Um, Denise Luciano is also on the line, too, and um, she'll help with, uh, with fielding some questions or, or clarifying any points that I don't get uh, perfect in this. Um, <clears throat> but the this project is brought forth and supported by the Economic Development Commission, and it truly is an economic development opportunity. So. One of the things that, that we focused on, um, I'm going to take you back a couple years, in May of 2018 at the annual town meeting, um, we voted in favor of two articles. One article was to um, implement a 3% excise tax imposed on the sale of, or transfer of marijuana. Um, and the second one was is that we authorized marijuana establishments in the industrial district within Norton. Um, and that was subject to special permit requirement and a site plan approval. Um, at that time, we already had a bylaw called the Registered Medical uh, Disp uh, Registered Medical Dispensary. I feel like I'm missing a D in there, but um, an RMD bylaw with uh, a lot of specific information in it, but that bylaw did not address anything that was passed at the May 2018 meeting. So um, slightly over a year later, the Economic Development Commission got together and we really looked at um, you know, what happened in 2018 and decided that, you know, as a business and, or I'm sorry, as an industry that it was a promising business opportunity. So a couple of things that we wanted to focus on um, specifically with, with this, um, with our work here was to um, increase our tax base by implementing the, the previous town meeting articles. So making sure that, you know, we were looking at, okay, we have this 3% um, excise taxes in place. We've said that marijuana establishments can move into industrial areas, but we really didn't act on it as a town. Um, and just to provide some clarity too, in respect to the terminology, a marijuana establishment includes um, not only a retail establishment, which we all think of like a pot shop, but it also includes cultivation, manufacturing. Um, what am I missing? I'm missing something else in there, but uh, it's it's more than just a retail establishment. So. We've had, uh, collectively, the EDC have had, we've had conversations with um, many potential applicants from each of these areas really to discuss what their needs were, um, how they could fit within our town character, and, and really, for a lack of a better term, just to learn more about the industry. So we took a lot of time um, to do that and, and really think through this process. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at this, we really saw it as, as an opportunity to leverage um, what we've already put in place in bringing that new industry into Norton. Um, of course, we have the increase in the revenue potential uh, by bringing that into town. Uh, the other thing, too, is, you know, we already had some of the groundwork late, so this was really an opportunity for us to enhance that, um, not only from a perspective of what do we look at from a zoning um, um, perspective, but how do we also look at it to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So it, I'll give you an example. I was at a conference where they talked about, um, you know, specifically any town that 
um, go through the process and, and they vote to put marijuana establishments in industrial areas really aren't serious about bringing in those areas into their town. Um, so it, it had somewhat of a negative connotation. I think that um, what I thought I remembered during that meeting, I felt like we, we did uh, a knee-jerk reaction to what was potentially out there. You know, some of the comments that were said were, if, if we don't vote for this to go in industrial, it can go anywhere in town, which um, isn't, isn't really a true comment, but, uh, you know, it, it was something to make sure that, that we took some action. Um, so what we want to do from the EDC perspective is, is really execute a reasonable and a thoughtful approach to how do we bring this industry into town within the character of the town. Um, so we, as I mentioned, we spend a lot of time doing this. And, and just to give you, um, you know, a little bit of background on here, you know, we wanted to focus not only on making sure that we partnered um, with other people within the town, um, we wanted to look at, uh, you know, how do we, how do we not only look at what's currently zoned in the industrial to make sure that it, it fits our character, but how do we also look at those areas in town, like commercial properties, um, where that's really the business we're looking at, to, to bring those into the marijuana overlay district. So we had conversations, we met several times with the planning board. We also had the opportunity to have the subcommittee of the planning board partner with us too, to really just give us feedback on what we were looking at. Um, we did a lot of research, not only um, within the, the local areas, just for retail, but you know, we looked at um, host community agreements. We looked at um, some of the other processes in town. So one of the things that, that we decided um, as we were going through this process, just so you kind of understand like from beginning to end is um, while we have um, by the state, we're required to enter into a host community agreement. Um, that's done at the at the select board and it's a negotiated agreement. Um, one of the things that was a recommendation was for us to also form a subcommittee to look at um, retail establishments specifically. So when we think about the town and, and I'll go through this as part of the bylaw right now, we, we are allowing 20% um, of um, retail establishments, uh, licenses specific to that at, as 20% of our liquor licenses. So right now we have nine liquor licenses and we would have um, two retail establishments in town. Um, we have, I think at present, six or seven potential applicants for retail industry, retail industries um, coming in. So, you know, what, what our recommendation was, was to, or I'm sorry, um, develop this, um, I can't even think of the name of it. It's a marijuana retail subcommittee. Um, we developed this subcommittee so we could go through the applications and essentially what will happen is uh, the subcommittee will make recommendations that will go to the, the board or to the select board um, to potentially enter into an HCA. Um, once that's done, then the applicant would have to apply for a special permit and then it would go through the planning board process. And there are a couple steps along the way, like they, they're required um, to do a information session on the locations that they've identified. Um, they would do that as part of the application process and also as part of the, the planning board, um, their special permitting process. So there are multiple stages where we as a town would be able to, to get involved, be informed, and, and really understand what the business is, um, who that business would be, and, and is the location feasible and something that we would want in town. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we met with the planning board. Um, we did meet with FinCom early on. Actually, I think it was, uh, if you guys remember, it was a joint meeting with the school committee and the finance committee um, just to present the project that we were working on and, and to get initial feedback. And, and really, I have to say, I mean, we've had great support. We've had really good feedback. We've made, we've made some changes. We've conducted um, an information session as well. Uh, um, and, you know, really we focused on what were, you know, the, the things that we wanted from an EDC perspective in respect to goals and then what were some of the, um, the pieces of feedback that we were getting from both the planning board and the, the um, public. Um, <clears throat> so any, any just initial questions before I kind of dive into the bylaw? Ms. I have one question. Sure. Go ahead, Zach. You can go first. All right, a couple of questions, Renee. Um, does this cap the number of licenses in each category, cultivation, retail? No, so so the only one that um, that is required, well, that would be required is retail establishments. So we are allowed, um, the state minimum is 20% is of retail establishments based on your liquor licenses. Um, the other what does that mean for the So it means two. At this time, we would be able to have two retail establishments. Okay, and... What 
have you gotten any worked on any numbers on what that means for tax base uh, so, if you did have those two establishments in Norton? So based on projections, um, you know, and, and we've had some folks look at this from a perspective of not only uh, more saturation within the industry around us, but also, you know, looking out two years by the time they get through the licensing process with the state, which takes about a year, if not 18 months, and then, of course, our permitting process. So. Um, one of the companies that that presented to us actually showed about five hundred thousand dollars that would come just from a tax a tax base. Um, and I should mention as well that the host community agreement that we would ent enter into also um, includes a community impact fee of an additional three percent. And that fee is specific to and there are specific guidelines to how you spend that money. But that money goes to things like um, drug awareness, education, um, training uh, for the police department or or other response units. So. That's specific as well. So, you know, when you think of that, like kind of how, how we talked about it within the EDC is, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not money that, that we just necessarily put right into the budget, but the money that could be used um, looking at a community impact could certainly alleviate some of the operational expenses that we currently have. Um, <clears throat> additionally, there are options for negotiation within the, within the HCA that allow for um, charitable donations as well. So, and, and again, it's it's a negotiation. Um, those aren't necessarily uh, going to be, you know, uh, what I would call, how would I call it? Um, they're not going to be something that, that may be in every HCA. And the HCAs are required across all marijuana establishments. It's not just retail, but the retail licenses are limited. Has it been historically uh, that these companies have come looking for tax credits? Do I forget the word right now? No. Um, uh, like a no? tip. Tip. Exactly. They're not. They wouldn't be looking for tips to bring jobs. No, we we have we've not. I've not seen that. Um, and again, with the HCA, it's 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 pretty different. You know, one of the things that we talk about within. Um, not only we'll do this as part of the application process, but the HCA is you know what what sort of employment opportunities does it bring to the area. Um, that's a concern of ours as well. And, and you know, overall, we really want to make sure that we're we're investing with a good partner and somebody who, based on their business model and based on the location that they identify, is going to be sustainable within the area. You know, this isn't this isn't something that we want to go into willy nilly. And and I think from perspective of um, the subcommittee as well as the select board, I you know I think we're going to do a pretty deep dive to make sure that we're making the right decision. And I assume you've had conversations with the police department in regards to this. What's their uh, view on it? Yeah, so um, Chief Clark actually went through the HCA and he went through the bylaw, and so so he gave us some revisions in respect to the language. Um, I can tell you, and, and I'll give him credit for this, at one of the select board meetings when he presented, he was um, he really came with a completely different focus the second time. Um, and I remember in 2018 when he spoke at town meeting, it, it wasn't something that that they fully backed, but. You know, he had a lot of conversations with other um, police chiefs that have opened up retail establishments and some of the original, um, I don't want to call them myths, but some of the expectations of kind of what bad things were going to happen really didn't come to fruition and they became, you know, quite comfortable with the operations and, and really the protocols that the state has put in place. The, the Cannabis Control Commission, they have some pretty strict regulations. So it's, it's uh, you know, part of our application process, we really piggyback on, on the requirements and the documentation that they have to give to the state. Uh, one, because they have to give quite a bit to the state, but two, because we didn't want this process to be so overburdensome that we didn't have anybody who wanted to do business in Norton. Thank you. You're welcome. So, okay. Renee, just so, yes. so I, I understand it correctly, the, the 20% is a State regulation, town regulation, just uh, best practice. What twenty percent? So twenty yes, percent. But let's say both. So the first thing is, is because Norton voted as the yes state, um, that is the minimum required, right? That's the state minimum that you have to have twenty percent. We didn't have to put okay. that in the bylaw. We essentially could have said, you know what, we're not going to put a cap on it. We're going to let the select board just make the decision on how many retail licenses we want. Uh, but we decided not only for um, really the comfort of folks in town, but also just to make a, a good business decision um, with a new venture that we would put the 20% um, state requirement in there. So if we wanted to change that, out of who, who has the authorization? Is that a town vote? Is that a, a 
select board can just change it? Yeah. So it, it depends. It depends which way we want to change it. Um, if we wanted to go more, if we wanted to take that 20% to 30%, right? It would be a bylaw change, and so it would go through town meeting. If we wanted okay. to change that 20% and take it down to 10%, um, that essentially goes against how the town voted. So it would be a town meeting, and it would be a ballot vote. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And there was, you know, I'll add to that, there was some discussion with the planning board about um, using that process to determine the number of licenses, and, and that is the process that's used by the state. It's, um, from our perspective, was a, a defined process. It, it made sense. They really put a lot of effort into that, and, you know, um, one of the planning board members has suggested that we do it based on our population, and the limitation with that is that, from a population perspective, we're looking at a population once every 10 years, right? So... You think about overall just um, what I would call not not really moving forward um, with potential opportunities like that could hinder us so that was one of the reasons why we stayed with really the defined process that the state had had implemented well one more question because it's, it's now somewhat related we have nine liquor licenses or we outstanding or we're capped at nine right right now we are capped at nine we're capped at nine and mm -hmm. that changes how uh that's a state process that mike would have to talk to mr units okay and, and i always thought that was somewhat population driven it, it is population driven and i believe we have one license right now that is um, kind of exempt from that um, I believe it's for the produce bar, and I've heard the history on it several times, but not not well enough for me to repeat it. Um, so, so is that included in the nine, or do we really have to? It, no, it's included in the nine. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And and Bill, just to to um, expand on that a little bit in respect to new licenses, that has to go through the select board, but it also has to go through the state. Board. So, so it's not like tomorrow where we all of a sudden will have 15 liquor licenses which then up the amount of uh, retail establishments that we can have. Correct. This is a municipality. We don't do anything that fast. <laughs> <laughs> anything else, Bill? Um, anyone else? Um, I, I got a I, I comment. I found this article from the Sun Chronicle from Monday, March 7th. 24, which that's old, so just ignore that part. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we had the the RMD article for a registered medical dispensary, and uh, we looked at that several times. Um, and, and Denise is the perfect person to have on the call because she rewrote that I, I would say three or four times. We went through several iterations. Um, what we came up with in in the end was essentially we are deleting that. Um, bylaw and we're putting in place an entirely new bylaw that, that both covers RMDs and the, the marijuana establishments. So <clears throat> I'll go through here um, from a change perspective. You'll see um, within our, our changes there is 
an, an update to the use regulations under commercial uses, um, you'll see that we expanded from an industrial uh, zone area to a village center and a commercial area. Um, I'm sorry, it's not village center because Paul, Paul would tell me right now, I'll, I'll just clarify before he jumps in, uh, marijuana is not permitted in the village center. Um, it is village commercial and commercial. Um, again, both, um, a, a, you'll see here an MTC, that's the new terminology for a registered medical marijuana dispensary. Um, it's now a medical marijuana treatment center, so an MTC. Um, and then the marijuana establishment as well. Uh, we made updates, so that would be um, include from an allowable use, it, use in both village commercial and commercial. Um, we did not make any changes to social consumption establishments. So those establishments are literally kind of like a bar where you would go and, and you would consume uh, marijuana on site. Um, those are still prohibited within the town of Norton. Um, the other addition in here, as I mentioned, we have a marijuana overlay district, which I'll go through just to show you the, it's, it's literally parcel by parcel. We went through as a group um, over several meetings and many, many hours to, to really identify what were the areas that, that we wanted to um, include within the overlay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we just did some cleanup in respect to the site plan approval, so nothing nothing big in this section. Um, we made some additional uh, mention here of the the regulations that we wanted to be included uh, for consideration, and then um, you'll see as we go down here. Um, as I mentioned, we bucketed everything: a marijuana establishment and a medical marijuana treatment center. They will have the same process within town, and they will be um, within the marijuana overlay. So we we will have covered it. Um, the planning board will now have uh, some direction in respect to the bylaw and, and the things that um, are able to, to take place within the town. <clears throat> um, if I move down, there's a section here where we've talked about some of the definitions. I won't go through these. There, there isn't any, um, any significant change from what is currently within the definitions. Uh, but what we felt was important here was for people who are reading this and certainly not really up to par on um, the, the terminology within the marijuana industry, we wanted to make sure that what we referenced within the bylaw was referenced here uh, from the perspective of a definition so you didn't have to go back to um, the MGL to, to see what things were um, defined as. Um, the, the other thing too is uh, I'm going to focus a little bit here um, on the additional requirements and conditions. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, the, the number of licenses, but the other thing that we, we did as a part of this bylaw is we also talked about the hours of operation. Um, so we looked at this holistically. There was no rhyme or reason across the states. Um, so really we looked at, you know, what are our, um, we kind of compared a lot to the liquor stores, like what are our liquor stores running at? Because it's a, a very similar um, controlled substance, yet um, legal use within the state. Um, the other thing too is, is you know, when we go through here, and here's the section on the marijuana retailers um, in respect to the licenses not to exceed 20% of the total number of licenses uh, for the alcoholic beverages. Um, but when we went through this, there were, there was a um, kind of a um, template that was out there that we leveraged, and we also looked at other um, bylaws too to, to really understand what was it that we wanted to do within Norton. Um, a lot of these things are standard. So when you when you think about um, the fiscal requirements for some of the items here, like no outside store, which is permitted, it, most of this is really defined with the state, and, and we just put it within our bylaw to make sure that the information was available. Um, the ventilation, we had quite a bit of discussion in respect to odor and odor mitigation um, from our public information sessions. And so we had uh, not only within um, the eight, HCA, but also within the bylaw, we went back and, and we did make some, some minor modifications. Um, town Council was really good at reviewing uh, these documents multiple times so that we made sure that, that folks were really comfortable with, um, with what we had. And so one of the things, um, and I have this on the, sh on the sheet, that when we presented um, to the planning board initially and then FinCom initially and then we came back for the final presentation, we talked about some of the things that changed. And one of the things that changed was when we looked at um, the odor mitigation, specifically with the cultivation facility and, and potentially with a um, manufacturing facility, um, one of the things that, that we did, like I said, it was a modification in, in the language, but what we also talked about was the planning board um, and, and being able to issue um, special conditions as a part of the permit. And so one of those conditions 
uh, that town council had recommended that they'd have to talk about if we had a cultivator who was interested in Norton is to limit the, the special permit, the length of time of the special permit, and also have a condition that um, its renewal is contingent upon, you know, having minimal complaints or if they have complaints, being able to mitigate those um, within reason. And I'm paraphrasing quite a bit there. Um, but again, making sure that, you know, everything that, that we did, while they will go through a significant process um, on the type of HVAC system they're going to have, um, putting in the fail safe, fail safe as part of the special uh, permit and the condition in the event that we do have issues. <clears throat> Um, the one of the things that, that we did too within the bylaw, um, I'm gonna just again kind of jump to areas that we specifically looked at for Norton. Um, it, we made sure that the marijuana establishments have to be located in marijuana overlay district. Um, the other thing that we did within the bylaw is that we said where um, specific parcels had uh, multiple zoning. So we have a lot of parcels within town where it might be part residential and part commercial or part industrial. Um, we were specific to say in order for a marijuana establishment to be in that location, it had to meet both the criteria of village commercial, commercial or industrial, and it had to be within the marijuana overlay. So there are some industrial areas within Norton that are not within the overlay, and there are obviously commercial areas um, that are not within the overlay either. So so we were we kind of did a, a fail safe there to make sure that again it, it met those two conditions. Um, we also said uh, we didn't want a marijuana establishment um, to be located within 500 feet of um, another marijuana establishment or or a uh, an MTC. And part of that is really when you look at it, we, we didn't want like an oversaturation um, of of retail establishments within a, a small location. So that that's I'm sorry that I'm I'm on this section here, um, item number four, and I kind of skipped. I mean, I'll come back to number three, but um, item number four, we specifically did um, for the purpose of, you know, making sure that we didn't want have retail establishments too close to each other. Um, item number three is actually from the state. Um, we cannot have a marijuana establishment within 500 feet of a school that's K through 12. Um, and I, I say that specifically for two reasons. One, because during the info sessions, we had a lot of questions pertaining to you know, some of the, the properties and the parcels that we put in the overlay, there are daycare centers there and there are daycare centers right now. Um, the state requirement um, does not acknowledge daycare centers. It's really looking at, you know, where kids might be walking um, and making sure that those areas are, are far enough away from the schools. Um, currently in the RMD, we have, have um, as part of the bylaw, it says that we can't have, I wanna say a marijuana establishment with it, or um, I'm sorry, a re uh, medical treatment um, center within 500 feet of another zone district. Um, there are some serious concerns with that because it really, it, it exceeds what the state did. And when um, I talked to that town council, she said it could certainly be challenged in court. Um, and there are some other conditions in there that, that really were questionable in respect to putting them within the bylaw. So it was something that, that we intentionally did not include because we wanted to make sure that we were um, doing things that we should be doing within the state regulations. Uh, the next area is, is pretty standard on the reporting requirement and, and really how the um, how the special permitting goes. Um, I won't go through this in, in great detail. It, it's not really anything that that uh, that we significantly change, um, but it does just talk about you know making sure that there's a contact uh, in place talks a little bit about the granting authority. Um, and then of course it goes into the issuance and, and um, the transfer of the special permit. Um, if I, let me think about this. We put some conditions um, in here uh, in respect to if, if we enter into an engagement or an agreement with a potential applicant. And uh, um, Denise, do you remember, I, I wanna say it's uh, it's a year um, we kind of put that sunset clause in. We didn't want, um, specifically when we think about the retail establishments, because we are limited in licenses, we didn't want somebody who we entered into an agreement with and, and really them not taking any sort of action, um, on that agreement. So we did put within the bylaw that, um, there is a, a clause that if, if they're not moving forward, that the, that the agreements would, um, would no longer exist. And I'll wait. Yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a little hazy. I'm not sure if it was in the bylaw or if we put it in the agreement. So, okay. Um, 
Uh, but it, it is in, in one of those. <laughs> it's a, it is. I, I know yeah. it's it's such a it's such a mix right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let me let's go into the special permit procedure. And again, I'm not going to go through everything here. Um, this really talks about what do you have to do? What are the requirements for a special permit and site plan approval? So before they can even get to the planning board, you know, again, they have to go through the HCA process. They have to identify um, a location, and that location is is part of the host community agreement. And as I mentioned, um, they'll have to have information sessions on that too. That's not just for a retailer. That is for any marijuana establishment or MTC that comes into Norton. So again, making sure that there's transparency so that the people understand um, where the interest is in, in these uh, businesses going into town and that they have an opportunity really to speak to those and, and provide their opinion on that. Uh, most of this information really just speaks to the special permit process. Um, I won't go through that in detail, but it, it just outlines really what do they have to do in order to, to, uh, to apply for the special permit. And then um, they have some specific requirements in, in um, not only the application process, but the state and this to provide us with information on their operational and um, their procedures throughout the process. Um, you'll see, I, I'm going to, I scroll down to this specifically because um, I just, uh, I think at every conversation, specifically around the retail establishments, we've had questions on the traffic um, and whether or not it's going to have an impact. Um, that seems to be the, the big the big topic in town. Um, and so there there is a section here that a traffic impact study, you know, will have to take place that's part of the special permit process. So I just wanted to point out that is in here. Um, let's see. And Bill, you guys had a copy of this, right? That was part of the, your meeting materials for the warrant. This is direct from the warrant, so. Yeah. Okay. If there are any questions, because like I said, I, I didn't want to go into, uh, you know, reading through the the um, each piece bit by bit. But if there are any questions, please, you know, don't hesitate to ask now or, or afterwards. Um, so most of this stuff is just general language at, at the bottom. I won't go through there. What I'd like to do, um, if there are no questions on the specific language, is really to um, move over to the marijuana overlay. I, I think that the visual really provides the better story than the written text here. So I'll wait for can, can a more questions. Sure. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. On on the sunset clause, I think that's what we call it. Um, Does it open us up for two? Kind of From like the perspective of, she said, she said, hey, I, I, I thought I was moving forward in the town. I spent all this money, blah, 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 and the town pulled my permit or whatever. No, so it's, it's not, um, it, when we give, when we give the, the time, I'm limit on that. It's not specifically if they're going through the planning process. So it's not like they apply to us one day and then you have 12 months to get this going, right? It's because we understand that, that our planning board and that process and conservation, depending upon the location that they're looking at, that can take some time. But if they're not making any effort or say that they're going through the special permitting process and then, uh, you know, the planning board's waiting for information and now we're waiting nine, 10 months and, and there's really no good faith that they're moving forward. Um, that's really when we start to talk about, okay, what do we do next, right? We, we just, a lot of things like that we learned through, through just looking across the state, there are um, hundreds and hundreds of HCAs in place, and there are not that many licenses in place. Um, so we wanted to put this in there so we understand that, that people are moving forward with it. Um, it's not going to hinder them if they get stuck with the CCC, as long as they're making efforts to, to progress and move it forward. And, and same thing with us, right? As long as they're going through the process, um, if they get held up because the planning board needs more time or whatever it might be, right? We have another another pandemic and we're pushing meetings off like we've, like we've done, um, you know, starting in Q1 of this year. Um, they're not going to suffer from that. It's, it's just to make sure that they continue on with the process and we're not stuck with holding up a license when there might be another applicant um, who's interested. I'm only good for one pandemic a lifetime. I know. So. <laughs> but 
Mr. Chairman? That, Renee, uh, I have a friend who's involved in this business and uh, as detailed as this is, and by the way, you guys have done an unbelievable job on this and the amount of work that you guys put into it. The state process is, is, is a nightmare from what I understand. So is a year enough for them to hear about our planning board, our conservation, the town's affairs, just to get through the state and all what they require is one year enough time for that? Well, it, again, it's it's not it's not based on uh, it's not like a, a hard timeline, right? It's not you apply with us on January first, you have to be done by December thirty one. Um, it's just to make sure that you continue moving forward. So if they're held up with the state, because the state they they are about to implement some some changes within their system that will take the the um, processing of applications to a whole another level, and hopefully they'll be able to turn around in two to four months. But we know right now it's twelve to eighteen months for the state to actually approve a license. Um, one of the applicants that we spoke with, um, they have, I want to say in, in one of their towns, um, because it's been through town meeting, they've had information sessions, like literally it's been two and a half years and they still have yet to get that license in hand, you know, from, from the, the town as well. So, um, it's, it's going to be something that, you know, from a select board perspective, we have to take a look at and we have to be on top of. And, you know, we've talked about, and, and I'm not sure if it's in place right now, but one of the things that we're looking to do um, on the website is really to list out who are the applicants and, and what status are they so that we, from an EDC perspective, really have an idea um, on, I don't want to say monitoring, but making sure that, that things are moving forward, right? Just so and it I would say, yeah. I'm going to take a wild guess and say the applicants that are coming forward already own other facilities of the state. They're not, not there's nobody coming that's brand new. Not all of them. No. No, there's there's a variety. We have we have um, family owned businesses, we have um, bigger corporations. So um, I don't know the status of the applications, what we've received thus far. Um, the application process right now for retail establishments is going to close, I believe, on the twenty fourth of August and then um, we'll get the subcommittee together and start reviewing those those applicants. Um, but from those who we spoke to just, you know, through our learning process, um, it's, it's been, you know, some family owned businesses, um, that this will be the first. They may have been in the industry, but in a different, um, capacity. And then we have some that already, they have a couple licenses. And we have some who are, you know, they, they have partnerships and cultivation, but they're looking for a retail establishment. So a variety of, of things. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, Zach. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Let me switch over to um, the overlay district here. It's not uh, recognizing it. Give me one second here to rewatch. Okay. So you should see up on the screen the Norton proposed marijuana overlay district. Um, this is the color version. I, I believe at our special town meeting it probably won't be in color because there's quite a bit of color on these. Um, we had actually, I think from uh, FinCom, um, when we first presented, one of the, the pieces, one of the pieces of feedback that we received was it was hard to distinguish within the map what we were actually um, showing as the marijuana overlay district. Um, at the time, there was a another layer of the watershed on there, and it also had a diagonal um, depiction, so it was very confusing. So we went back um, and we did two things. One is is we changed the layers what we're showing, um, and we also went to a satellite view as well as a parcel view. So you'll see um, for every area, you actually see two different maps. Um, this particular one is showing the entire town. You'll see that there are um, really five different, what I'll call districts right now, um, that we focused on to be included within the overlay. Um, we have one, Route 140 North, uh, so this is up by the Xfinity Center. We have the Norton Commerce Center, which is on the other side in the Industrial Park, and then we have the East Main Street Business Park, which is uh, 495 at 123, it's the new Industrial Park. Uh, just I, and I'm just using them as the area because there's more involved. Um, and then we have the business and industrial zones that in chart uh, I'm sorry, and then the industrial zones in South Norton. Um, so some of these areas 
uh, all had the industrial uh, industrial zone properties, and that was really our starting point for looking at what did we want to include in the, in the MOD. Um, this is just another way to look at it. This shows what the actual zoning areas are. Everything in purple, um, if you're not familiar with these, with this type of map, is industrial. And then the, uh, the more red shade is commercial. And then village commercial is the pink. And this, again, is um, Route 140, just so you have a um, kind of a starting point. <clears throat> so when we look at this, um, this is down on 123 heading into Attleboro. Um, this area specifically, I believe, let me go back one, I think it was all industrial um, and commercial in here. And when I mentioned the, the split parcels, let me go to the next screen, um, these are the parcels here, and you'll see they had two different zone districts. So we had one set that had industrial, and then the other side of that parcel had commercial. So what we did with the overlay map is, again, it has to meet the two conditions, has to be in, in these, um, in a commercial, village commercial or industrial area, and it has to be within this map. Um, this is actually a really good map to look at because you'll see there are a lot of other commercial areas in here that we did not include. There's also this section here that's industrial and this section that's industrial. These are 500 feet within a school, so that's why they're not included within the overlay because they don't meet the state requirements, um, and so we didn't include them in the overlay either. Um, so this area here, as I mentioned, we, we literally went through every parcel. Um, it's not an easy process with, with the town. Paul and, um, and his team did a really good job of digitizing these things. Um, but it, it was still, you know, it's, it's still difficult when you look at them trying to figure out what exact area um, does this cover. But um, this is heading out of town. So we focused on, again, where did we already have some commercial opportunities to, to put the industry in? Um, additionally, um, we looked at the East Main Street business parks. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's the Condine area. Um, let me go into the, the zoning area first. Um, so this is the Blue Star. Um, is it Blue Star Memorial or just Blue Star? I, I can't remember, but um, the, the new industrial area um, right here, this is the Dunkin' Donuts Plaza, and then moving up, it's the uh, East Main Street Apartments, Red Mill Village, which is not, these are not within the overlay. And then um, the industrial area up here that has, I believe, Bernie and Phil's, and, and there's a, it's a Bolch Gym or something up there. Um, so these remained, from an industrial perspective, these remained within the overlay. There were no changes. And then we added in um, this bit of commercial area here, too. Um, next is the Norton Commerce Center. So this is the, this should be um, South Washington Street here. Um, and then, of course, Taunton in the exit off of Bay Road to get into the, uh, the industrial um, park here. There was no change on this. This was already included within our, our previous article um, that was approved in 2018 to show the industrial area. So we just applied the marijuana overlay onto this to, to include it holistically. Um, Route 140 North, this is probably the biggest change that, that we did. We had a, a lot of discussion on this, um, specifically because there are a lot of properties where there are homes that were zoned as commercial. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned early on, we wanted to make sure when you look at things um, in perspective to the character of the town, we wanted to make sure that we were doing the right thing. So we wanted to look at, um, even though something may have been zoned as commercial, we wanted to make sure that we really wanted it to be commercial. It wasn't a residential property, even though it sat there. Um, we had quite a bit of discussion on this. Um, you'll see that, um, from a perspective of zoning, there wasn't anything within this area that was zoned as part of uh, 2018 because it wasn't industrial. Uh, but we went through and we really looked at, you know, it's 140, it's a, it's a main, uh, main road within the town. And really it's, it's focused on commercial, right? Um, this big area here is, is, uh, the TPC. Um, so you pick a parcel and it, it picks the entire area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we had a lot of discussion. I think this, this has, was updated after our discussions. Um, this previously was, was showing as commercial in this area, but this was rezoned, I want to say, at the end of last year to village commercial. Um, but again, you know, we went through here and we, we picked the parcels um, specifically on 123. And I may have missed that in the, the bylaw. One of the things um, that we put in there too as part of the bylaw was that a marijuana establishment or MTC had to have primary access through a main thoroughfare. That was important to us, especially when we got down to 140 where, you know, mass gas and that is. We didn't want people to, um, if you see this property here, this is Reservoir Street, right? We didn't want this to become a commercial area. So while you may build on this property, access through it has to be, sorry, on this property here, access has to be off of 140. You can't have a backdoor access here be your primary area 
um, in a residential neighborhood. Um, and, and there's a couple of lots that I, I saw on there as well that a couple of lots that are split between, let's say, village commercial and residential. The marijuana establishment can only be on the portion of the lot that's zoned for village commercial, so they can't put the building or the business on the portion of the lot that is zoned as residential. Just for clarity. Thank you, Denise. Yes. Um, the other thing, too, is you'll see the, the big purple here. Um, this is actually the uh, the site formerly known as Reed and Barton. Um, it is zoned industrial. Um, however, you'll see around it, it's all residential. And we looked at when we looked at that and really thought about, you know, travel went to town, um, going to any sort of a, a commercial establishment. We didn't feel that this was appropriate to include in the, the zoning. So while it was approved in 2018 because it is industrial, it was not something that we included within the marijuana overlay. Um, and the next is, are the industrial zones in South Norton, and I have to tell you, I get the most confused on this on this map um, because I can't remember if this is the railroad track or if it's another one. But every time I look at it, like I have to take a step back to think about what I'm actually looking at. A um, couple of changes that we did here uh, when we looked at the industrial area. This is Winslow Farms right here, and it was kind of odd. Um, and I should say we we did the team. The team collectively, um, we did many drive-bys um, to the point that, you know, we were out there taking pictures and, and sharing it with the group just so we had an understanding of, of what we were looking at. Um, you know, and I think Paul was the first to admit, um, especially when we first embarked on this, that the diagrams that we have, sometimes there's no rhyme or reason for what was zoned industrial or commercial. So we really had to take a step back and, and look at it to say, regardless of its zoning, does it still make sense for us to include it? Um, so when we looked at this section here, it's it's very odd because it has like industrial that goes back along here and then it ends on this other side, even though Winslow Farms is, is um, residential. Um, and these are actually three homes on this side. So when we looked at this, one, this wasn't this wasn't really a um, uh, an area here that, that we felt would be something that, that most um, establishments would want, but we really wanted to focus on on the access in and out. So um, we did not include this section here within the overlay. Um, the other sections, though, from a perspective of, of being industrial, um, those just stayed as is. Uh, Renee, one, one quick question for you. Mm -hmm. the, um, the criteria that's used on, I see some of these lots are close to residential. When you, go, when you went plot by plot, what was that criteria used to select the ones that you would include versus ones you would leave out? So, you know, again, we looked at um, what businesses were there, um, what was in the area, uh, really traffic, you know, and, and how the traffic would go to and from. And, and a lot of it, too, I mean, you can't, there's really, you know, we, we kind of laugh, or at least I laugh when, when I looked at the, um, the existing bylaw because it had that, that criteria that you couldn't, you couldn't be in a parcel that abutted another zoned area. Um, and that's really all Norton is. I mean, we have, you know, when we're looking at it, like you don't really see one one specific area that at some point doesn't touch residential. I mean, even even back here, and and it's just the way it is. And you know, Paul talked earlier about the fact that we have 123 and we have 140, and those are our, those are two of our primary areas. And then we also have this these industrial areas here. So we had a lot of conversations on these, really, to to determine whether or not um, it made sense. We had some discussions, you know, and, and I think we re-voted re on a couple areas to make sure that, that we were making the right decision. But again, it was overall looking at, um, you know, how is it zoned? In, in some cases, you know, we, we looked at, I I went back to Paul on a couple of these and, and really tried to understand the history of it because if I can zoom in here, you'll see it's, in, in some, I can't zoom in here. Um, in some areas, it's just, it's weird. Like this section right here, um, this was an, an item that the EDC reviewed a couple of times. You'll see right in the middle there are two houses. Um, and, you know, we asked Paul to go back, and really this had been zoned as, it was actually zoned as heavy industrial in the times, like in the early 70s. Um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were making the right decision that it was always that way. So if I think of it from my perspective, like I said, you know, I live on South Washington Street. I knew there was an industrial park at the end of my street. Like I have the expectation that there's going to be industry going in there. And so that's, you know, why we did some, um, extra drive-bys and, and took some pictures and had more discussion on it. 
just to make sure that that we were we were looking at it correctly. The other thing that we consider too is, you know, a lot of when you think about marijuana, most people really just think about the pot shops and they think about the traffic and and you know the clientele and things like that. Um, and it's kind of funny because the clientele, it's 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 really you know the the 40 plus clientele, um, sometimes a, a little bit higher. It's it's not it's not specifically like you know people are like well teenagers can go there or kids can go there. Um, you know we 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 talked about many times with the daycares, you know, the question is like, what are we worried with the daycares? Like the kids aren't going to crawl over and, and get pot, right? Um, but, you know, somebody had said, well, what about the workers? Well, if, you know, that's that's really, it's it's an issue for the owner, but, you know, regardless of, of where a marijuana establishment goes, if you have a retail establishment and somebody is going to use, it, it doesn't matter if it's in your parking lot or if it's two miles away, right? They're going to use it. So, you know, we, we had a lot of conversation in that. Um, so when we looked at this really, you know, I, I don't want to say that that really was a discussion on the character of the town, but, you know, one of the, um, one set of opposition we had was with the Roach Brothers Plaza, right? Certainly it's, it's a commercial area. It's been a commercial area. So we, we really had a lot of discussion on why isn't that appropriate. And, you know, a lot of it is, um, I think, and, and Denise, please correct me if I'm wrong, but just in our conversations of, you know, what we were looking at, um, what the what the retail industry really looks like, and, and trying to debunk some of the myths, um, that just providing the general awareness and really the thought process of not only what did we do from a zoning perspective, but also from the application perspective and, and having multiple controls that I think just providing that awareness to people really changed opinions and um, and overall, it kind of helped us to, to say, you know, yes, we did the right thing here. Yeah, I would agree. And I would say that it's no no different than looking at a, an alcohol establishment in those locations as well, right? So you shouldn't view it as anything more hazardous or harmful than a liquor store being in the same vicinity. So that is, that's the last um, area. I'll put back to the beginning if anybody um, has any questions or, or wants to talk about any of these areas that we've included within the marijuana overlay. And Renee, just a quick question. Who, who's on the subcommittee reviewing all of this? So the subcommittee is the Industrial Development Commission, as well as um, the town manager and uh, the planning director. So both Paul and Mike. And then we'll con we'll consult as needed, um, you know, from uh, both Chief Clark and Chief Sims' perspective, or if, if we need to get the building inspector and board of health involved, we'll do that as well. And then who's re who's reviewed the article as written right now and given their approvals on this? Um, you are the last one, so. So it's been in front of the, the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, um, obviously Town Council multiple times. Um, I think that's it. And then police and fire had the opportunity to? Yes. Okay. Um, so, so Chief Clark, um, as I mentioned, he had given some language within the HCA. We do have um, an outstanding item to sit down and, and talk about this with uh, both Chief Simmons and Chief Clark. Um, that was scheduled initially for April, but just due to COVID, um, we didn't have that opportunity. So that is still on my my to-do list. Would that potentially change the article? No. No, it's more for awareness. Okay. This is, um, we finalized this, um, you know, the maps have the May date on it when we went back and, and just asked for some, some tweaks to what was initially there. The, the warrant also has, I believe, a list of parcels that are impacted. Um, Paul can tell you best, but this was a huge effort uh, for his department in not only the notifications to abutters because there were so many, um, but also putting the signage around town that there was going to be a zoning change. So we've, we've tried to, you know, as I mentioned, we did an info session. Um, we've tried to get the information out through social media, through the info sessions. I, I think the, the virtual platform has certainly helped, um, and we've been recording all of our meetings, so they're available in the Norton Media Center, too, if, if anybody wanted to go through and, and listen to them. The info session we actually did as a, as a panel, so a couple of the um, applicants, that we, the potential applicants that we could talk to from various industries, um, not only the retail establishments, but also the, the cultivation, and um, there was a manufacturer uh, represented as well. We had them on. 
um, to just talk talk about the industry overall, what were some of their challenges, some of the concerns, and you know that that and it wasn't it wasn't um, like a marketing um, uh, meeting for them. It was more about how can we share the information and make sure that people are aware of the industry, the process. Um, and really just be comfortable with it. You know, our goal here is, is to have the support of the different boards and committees in town and, and also have the support of the townspeople to move forward. Any other questions? If anyone is interested in, in watching that info session, let me know and I can shoot you the link from the North Media Center. And it might be up on, um, actually it should be up on the uh, Economic Development Commission's Facebook page. I'm trying to think if it's on the town website too. I, I can't recall. I don't know if Joe Parker's there to to ask um, for, for Denise if you remember. I'm looking down here. <laughs> okay. It might be on um, the developments site versus the, uh, actually I thought we put it on the EDCs. Uh, Laura is not available to check. Okay, thanks Sorry. Joe. No, no, that's okay. I don't. I didn't expect her to be. I just saw her pop in on you earlier, so I thought I'd ask. I, I can tell you, Renee, I, yep. I got this for a cultivator like a year ago, um, manufacturer, cultivator was going to do the whole, you know, retail, manufacture of edibles, growing, it, it's just a fascinating um, conversion of an old mill property. Just used to, it was just fascinating. Um, Renee, the info session is posted on the EDC website. And it's posted June 26. Okay, thank you. Yep. So you guys can always go there, or again, feel free to shoot me a note or anyone on the EDC, and we'll make it easy for you to send you the link to. But it was it was a good session, and, and really the the panelists, um, you know, there's like 20 minutes of me talking, which is just boring. It's just like you had tonight, um, maybe a little more exciting. Um, and then we went into the panelists, and then you know had some discussion, uh, had questions from the public, and. It was good. I, I thought it was good, and, and Denise and I have had, you know, we've we've received um, feedback. Uh, Paul has received feedback, so we we essentially, um, I don't think there's anybody who we got feedback from that we didn't reach back out to and and have further discussion and provide them with more information. Not that I'm aware of. I think we responded to everybody, and everybody was was very polite, and and um, mm -hmm. I think everything went well. And if not, we completely got it wrong, but I think it was. Great. Well, if there are no questions, then, uh, you know, we'll just ask for your support in moving this uh, forward again to the special town meeting on August 29th. So, does anybody want to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, Amy. I move that we approve Article 6 as written in the warrant for the special town meeting. Second. Was that Barney seconding? You betcha. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second to recommend, I think this was Article 6. It was six and seven, so we'll have to do them separately. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So Article Six, as written in the special town uh, meeting warrant. Uh, any further discussion? I'm hearing none. So the vote, Amy. Aaron? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Mike? Yes. 
Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Zach? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that's unanimous for Article 6. Mr. Chairman. Amy? I move that we recommend Article 7 as written in the warrant for special town meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second to recommend Article 7, and why can't I find it? Um, If there are no further discussions, we can go to the vote. Amy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Tony? Yes. Mike? Yes. Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Zach? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Yes, so that too is unanimous. Excellent, uh, thank you guys. Mike. Appreciate the support. Um, the next article is on uh, okay. and um, Paul will present that. Hi, this is a, a, a pretty short one. Uh, this article, there, there's two changes to it regarding uh, zoning bylaw amendments. One just further clarifies what the bylaw means when they say amendment, and it clarifies it to say we could either be a change to the text of the bylaw or or a mapping change. The other is to delete or uh, delete a provision that a local provision that requires us to put signs in and around the area of a rezoning change. Uh, it's not a state mandate, and we also felt like with the expenses and some other hurdles, and we're finding that we get a lot more response by you know, social using social media, uh, we have you know, channel 15 or Norton Media Center helps us advertise these, so we can get a lot more, a uh, lot more advertisement, uh, uh, and it's a lot easier to administer than going through the process of, uh, of putting signs up. And that's it. Does anyone, our chair? That, that's all. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Plus, I plus I assist you with putting stuff on the Peter channel. And Peter helps us. Yeah. Peter advertises so, a lot for us. So, how much money would you say you have to expend to put up the sign, you know, print the sign, post the sign, and all that kind of stuff? Um, well, when, but for the last, we had to put the signs up this for this uh, round for the Village Center Four and for uh, the marijuana. Um, gosh, we, it was done so long ago because everything got pushed back. But it was several several hundred dollars for all of those signs. Uh, you know, plus we'd have to f factor in the cost of designing it. Um, you know, the bigger, the bigger obstacle is there's a requirement that says those signs have to be in the ground three weeks before the first planning board public hearing. Typically, a notice that goes in in the newspaper or out to a butters, it's two weeks prior. That three weeks has been a problem. Uh, it caused us a couple couple town meetings ago to end up having a having public hearing, uh, the planning board hearings very close to the town meeting. We know how that went. And that was one of the reasons why was because we couldn't schedule, you know, because of that three week rule. It was just a real, you know, it was a, that was a real hurdle. But it would cost, you know, depending on the number of signs we've had to put out. But in this case, we had to put a lot out. So it was a few hundred dollars uh, for the signs. So I, I, I know I'm going to, well, thank you for that information. Um, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record and, and 
and whatnot in that, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I gotta tell you, the sign, had it not been for being on FinCom, are the only way I know when something is happening in my neighborhood. Because I'm, I'm not on Facebook or any of those social media things. And so if you, if you came back to me and said thousands upon thousands of dollars, you know, I'd be, I'd be thinking, hmm, well maybe. But you're talking hundreds of dollars and I'm not the only one who says, hey, did you see that sign on the telephone pole? What's that about? I, I don't, I don't see what the big deal is to spend a couple hundred dollars to paste a few, uh, you know, a handful of signs out because, you know, what do they say? Picture's worth a thousand words. The picture on the phone pole that I passed used to pass every day, you know, I notice when there's something on it that wasn't on there yesterday. So, uh, you know, for me, short of being on FinCom, as I said, I have no no way of knowing what's happening until it's too late. But, oh, I, no, I appreciate that. I should also mention, of course, we have to mail notices to abutters. And that doesn't mean if, even if you're in a neighborhood, you'll get it. But we always send out to uh, uh, property owners within 300 feet uh, of the proposed rezoning. So we do have that. I would just say I, I don't think this was this was never a cost issue for us. It was certainly the three week rule. And then there are it does take time to put these signs together. You know it, it you know it, it takes some number of hours for us to do it. Then we have to go out and put them down. Uh, it, it's just uh, more, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of little steps we have to take to make sure that all gets gets in place, and other things can be done a lot more simply and still get out there uh, to a bigger audience. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I, Steve, I would agree with you 100%. I'm one that's not on Facebook. I'm not on social media. I go by these signs and I see them out there and then you start prompting, you know, what's that for? But Paul, with that said, I'm in full agreement with Bill, but if you know there's a three week requirement to get that done, we should know that way up front before and kind of step back from the due date. That shouldn't be something that's um, driving it. But tell me just a little bit on what the replacement method would be to reach out to all of those involved. If you're going to go to social media, we know that a lot of people aren't on social media. And the most important thing is to get people involved and let them know what is happening in their area near their homes. How would you accomplish that without the signs? Because I'm making well, some days you see those signs, and honestly, the only thing it prompts that is so small is to question on research. And half of them, when there's bad weather, are blowing all over the town. Right. But right. I, so, I mean, that's another issue, right? They get blown down and. Or they stay up. I mean, some signs have been up six months after the town meeting. Agree, but well, I again, I, yeah, I like my to understand the protocol. My experience is we, we, it's the list that goes to the abutters is certainly a probably the most direct because those are the people immediately be around the rezoning site, so they get they get letters mailed to them. I mean, that's the that's a big one, and that's a state requirement, so they get it. Um, you know, again, we, in addition to the social media, we also, you know, we have a great partner with the North Media Center who will run notices for us up on their channels. Um, so we feel like that, that covers a lot of it. Um, I, it, you know, yeah. I don't seem to hear from people who say, I saw the sign and I mean, I understand it. I mean, that's, I've been, you know, doing this a long time, but. The trend is really away from that, and again, the amount of work that goes into it doesn't really give us a, a, a as much, you know, the, the reward that we're trying to get, which is getting the word out, not as much as, say, you know, mailing out to the abutters. Yeah, I mean, just to, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amy, go ahead, Amy. 
Just to play devil's advocate with uh, with my friends Bill and Steve here, I have to say that when I'm flying past things at 30, 35, 50 miles an hour, you know, um, I don't really have the capacity to read them quickly enough to see what they say. And I would have to say that for as much conversation over the last three years as there has been on the Main Street Sewer Project, we still get people on social media that's like, hey, why are they digging up 123 in the middle of the town? Now, like this week, people are asking. So I, I'm not feeling it with the signs. I think it's a waste of energy and cash to put them out there because I don't think they are impactful. But they're not made to for you to see them and, and be able to really uh, digest them at 30, 40 miles an hour. But I can tell you, as there was rezoning in, in my neighborhood and whatnot, you know, on a weekend, I would walk to the sign. And I'd, I'd read it and go, ah, that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, again, if, if I'm not on social media and I'm not part of FinCom and I'm, I'm a member of, of the town, who doesn't dial in to, to Norton Media to see what, what's happening in the town, you know, the picture is worth a thousand words, and, and it's a visual, and it, it will get your attention whether you take the next step. You know, that's up to you, but it's a visual, and you can say, hey, what's that about? And if, and if you don't stop, Maybe one of your neighbors can and will tell you this is what it's about. So I, I again for a couple hundred bucks, and I can't imagine it's all that much work. No offense. It's um, well, it, it's again, it's a lot of little steps that have to happen, and it's just as a business decision. You go, is that you want to spend that amount of time to get maybe a person to see it? I mean, that's that's what that's. It, you know, if it were if it were getting a lot of, of you know people doing it, we would we would certainly be doing it. We just don't get a sense that that's actually happening. I I can tell you when when the zoning those little signs went up here three years ago, that one little sign got this whole neighborhood in an uproar. It wasn't people watching one of your you know media center presentations, it wasn't someone going to an a info session, it was the people within the neighborhood who saw the sign and all got together saying, what the heck is going on? That's from a picture. So, you know, it was nothing else. So Jim? they all impacted. Peter. So I'm looking at the changes that want to be made. I'm looking at uh, <clears throat> section B, where it says, uh, "Notice of hearings, such hearings which shall include proposed textual under map amendments, shall be mailed to all property owners." That's what's changed in B. In part two, by deleting in its entirety uh, zoning map amendments, and then what's being deleted talks about uh, three weeks prior to public hearing shall submit an accurate map drawn by a registered land surveyor. So I, I seem, it seems like we're dropping an accurate map supplied by, by people for the place. Are we dropping the accurate map, or is that also listed somewhere else that I don't see? Well, that provision is also quite problematic because that provision says a land sur surveyor has to produce it. I mean, that, I, you know, we are using assessor map data. All the purpose of it, it's just a notice, an advertisement for, for it. So with the maps that we've put out, we do show uh, uh, I think clearly where where the rezonings are happening. That's, but, but we also put that in the notices that go to the abutters. So the abutters get the maps as well. So the maps will still be up there and then on social media the maps will all be available on social media. But, but, Paul, 
from, again, from going through this process, it's, it's a very, um, uh, I, I'm not going to get the right word right now. It's a very defined definition of who the butter is. Because again, during this process, I got a notification. My neighbor didn't. So, you know, so even though it impacts both of us, I'm the only one that got the notification. Well, it's because I fit, I fit that criteria of so many feet within, you know, the chain. But it impacts my neighbor just as much. So what was then? The visual. Right. I, I don't I don't see a way around it. I, I, I think you to me it's trying to hide something in the well, greater public that should not be hidden. Well that that's not our intent. That is not our I, intent. I, I well I, I wanna make sure people clear our goal is transparency and our goal is to try to add we want to see more people showing up at meetings. That this is the important thing because this our process works when there's participation. I mean, I guess I would, you know, you made a great point when, when people see signs, they talk to other people. I would just say people do the same thing when notices go out. Because I hear that a lot when people say, uh, you know, we, my neighbor received a notice and told me about this. So that's an important thing. If, if people are concerned about something that they should go through their channels, if they even get a, if they get a notice in the paper to make sure that their neighbors have it as well. Mr. Chairman, sir, that is the compromise position here that we remove the signs and we go from 300 feet uh, notification to about us, to, let's say 600 feet to notification of about us. Would that make everybody happy? I don't even know if we can change this at this uh, at this stage, but yeah, you would be causing an amendment, I think, or I'm not sure. Um, but I would say if we double all the arguments, I mean, if we expand the number of abutters, that would uh, that would uh, suffice the chairman, I believe. I won't speak for him, but Mr. Chairman, yeah, yeah, the uh, I, I also am questioning if we could leverage the Norton Alert technology to help dispel some of the consternation on this issue. And if there's a possibility for email or phone alerts to people in that general vicinity, maybe we could leverage that to help alleviate the need for the sign. But, but I bet it, it's still that definition of it impacts you, but it doesn't impact your neighbor based on the definition of how you have to notify in the order. But in reality, it impacts your neighbor just as much as you. So, so that that that's my hold up. You know, I, I'm I'm just voicing an opinion, and and well, clearly, if if it hasn't been uh, uh, clearly uh, indicated, we'll vote against it. But um, it, it it comes into the the definition of a body, and and that. And it sounds like it's more work to, to go back and change that than it would be just keep putting the signs up. Mr. Oh, Chairman. Okay. Who Mr. is Ch that? That's Kevin. Kevin! Hey! hey. Um, yeah. So I think I, I agree with the, with the Chairman on this because I think the the overriding issue here is that the town has an obligation to try to reach as many people as possible when there's important issues like this. And so by making this change, you're deliberately excluding those who are not on social media or, well, not deliberately for nefarious reasons, but you are reducing the number of people that you're going to be notified um, because there's a number of people in this town that do not have that are not on social media. Um, and so for them, you know, the physical 
at having a physical sign somewhere where they walk or they drive. I've stopped and looked at when when the Blue Star project was was being proposed. I stopped and looked at the signs as I was driving by to see what they were. You know, and I'm on social media, um, and I know a number of people recently have reached out to me and said, "Hey, I saw these signs about the marijuana change, the marijuana zoning change." So I just think the town has an obligation to try to reach as many as people as possible. And I think by making this change, you're opening yourself up to the types of things where people will say, well, why only certain people get notified? Why only people who are on social media? Why are only people with email addresses? Why are they the people that get notified and not me? So that's that's my opinion on it. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think Steve has tried, been trying to get his voice heard a number of times, but he's not on video, so Steve, why don't you go? Okay, Bonnie, I'll go ahead, Bonnie, I'll go right after you. No, I insist. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I was just going to say that I think that while I agree with you that we have sort of a duty to notify, and I could possibly get behind Zach's suggestion for that reason, I think we want to get away from these being the methods, because I think that they're already outdated and quickly becoming more outdated as ways for people. I could see people saying, if the only way for me to receive a notification about this is being at a butter within 300 feet or this sign, it would be easy for me to miss the sign. I mean, plenty of people would say, I didn't even know about the meeting because I didn't see the sign, or I didn't know about the zoning changes because I didn't see the sign. I don't think that relying on a sign that's two feet by two feet on the side of a road that doesn't have a sidewalk that you drive by at 35 miles an hour is a good way for us to disseminate information about these types of things in town. So while I agree with you that there may be people who are not on social media or perhaps don't keep in touch with their neighbors, I think when something like this is distributed to the abutters, what immediately happens, and you guys can speak to this having been um, involved with this in your own neighborhoods, is that it's screenshot and it's posted in multiple places, and it's texted to everybody that you know. Um, so even if you're not on social media, you would probably still catch wind, because if your neighborhood is invested in, you know, banding together, or whether it's for or against something, then then they're going to do so. So, my two cents. And, and I just wanted to, I, I agree with that. I think for right now, though, the article is as written. And I think we have to really figure out a way to reach out to more and more people. We don't want to be viewed as minimalists, which I know that's not the intent, but that's what it's starting to look like. We want to do the least work to reach out to the least people to satisfy our why. Well, well, I guess my biggest point, Paul, on this one, yeah. I thought this came up several years ago at one of the town meetings where it seemed like this exact conversation was going on about the, the, the maps and the posted and the, and the posters on the side of the road. It was pretty much the same conversation we're having right now. Does anyone else recall that meeting? Yeah, that that was a couple of years ago, and and it, it was a whole. Uh, it, it was a mess because certain again, certain people got the notifications, other people thought they should have gotten it and they didn't, and you know it. It just created a mess. And that, that might have been, was that the, the, was it solar over the cranberry bogs or something? Oh, well, that was, that's a different issue, uh, because the, uh, that's a very different issue. They were, they were thinking that, that the text language was a, Zoning, a rezoning change, and it's not. No, I think right, but I think the meeting um, was more on 140 again. Some kind of rezoning that was that. That's what I remember, but I'm not sure. But I know that was probably that, my same. my neighborhood then. But I do know the conversation was the same, and now we're trying to. It appears to get rid of that kind of requirement. So I think we need to do some more work. On figuring out how to reach out to more people with more current technology, but for right now, I think the article is as written. And correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, on that one. Yeah, I, I believe you're correct. It, and again, I want to mention somebody had asked earlier about using North Alerts. We do use that as well, so um, we, we 
they've been using. Uh, we've actually gone, I mean, the, the, the state requirements and the bylaw requirements are pretty, they're the minimalist. A butters sign, well, the state doesn't require signs. But uh, we do use both the social media, the uh, North Alerts, and uh, and the North Media Center to to broaden the outreach uh, for for different uh, amendments. Mr. Chairman, this is Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to see for me to get on board with something like this. I'd like to see it uh, sort of. Uh, resolved not for a particular project, but as an overall policy. And that, okay, this is the way we do it now. Signs are out for everything and we have new means to, you know, and, and we've, we've agreed the technology is there, uh, or, you know, whatever means we're going to use to, 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 to get the outreach. Um, but to do it in association with a particular, particular project, particular plan, um, and, and have that be where where this happens the first time it puts us in the position of weighing a little bit of money and a, and a considerable amount of uh, Paul's time and effort, which uh, you know um, against our effort to fully inform as best we can the members of the town. And, and Paul, I uh, sincerely mean with all due respect for your considerable time and effort because I, I have great respect for it. Um, I just. Uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the idea of of, uh, of of passing on taking every measure that we can take to get the word out until we have an agreed replacement in place for doing so. Does that make sense? And, and, and Alan, to your point, and I know this is this is, you know, technology, I think we have, money, I'm not sure we have, but if you want to take away the, the you know, paper signs and whatnot, and, and I know, you, you know, you can come back and say, well, what if I don't drive or, or something like that, but, you know, an electronic sign like that is in front of the town hall or that is in front of the uh, Yale school, but more to the commuting route, i.e. coming in off of 495 at Xfinity Center on, say, the, the, um, uh, the Norton Rex building uh, that across from Cumberland Farms or you know, somewhere you're entering in from Taunton, so that, you know, that's a way also to get someone's attention through, lucky enough, if you're driving past it, when it's a zoning article or something, you, you know, blah, 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 go to this website or something. Yep, you're doing 30 miles an hour. Yep, it, there's a chance you won't see it today, but maybe you'll see it tomorrow. I, I just don't think, to your point, we figured out how to get it out to the town, the town's people, in a sufficient manner before taking away a way that works for some of us who are not, again, on social media. Yeah, in a way, I agree with both sides here, right? There's a better way to do it, but we don't have that better way in place yet, so... It's not time to move on from the archaic way just yet, but we should right. make every effort to do so in the future and soon. I, I don't disagree with that, but I, I don't think we figured that out. Um, no. And no, and, and unless, you know, FinCon member has have any more points, counterpoints, you know, I'll, I'll take a, uh, a recommendation here. Yes, Mr. I, Chairman. Oh. Amy. I move that we approve Article 8, 
as written in the warrant for special town meeting. Do I hear a second? Second. Do you have the vote? Thank you. All right. We have a motion and a second to recommend article 8 as presented. Um, if there are no further discussion, we'll go to the vote. Amy? Yes. Alan? Uh, with apologies to Paul's time, no. Bonnie? Yes. Mike? Yes. Peter? No. Steve? No. Zach? No. Kevin? No. And I'm a no. So... The Six recommendation has failed. And everybody, um, I was looking at some old articles of the Sun Temple from the early to mid 70s about the Richie Moore Library at North Adler, and the uh, and then Tom Norton advertised in the Sun Chronicle way back in the early to mid 70s, and that's the only way that people found out about the Sun meeting. All oh, management by it. We're ran back to your midst of these. I would find out in paper and go to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, Mike, is that it? That is it. That is it. So, in less, um, you know, anything pop, what was in the next? I, if not, if anything pops not up me. by Thursday, um, at, by Friday, I'd be able to let you know if there was anything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will okay. we have to meet again for articles mm -hmm. one to three, or would that just be yeah. that morning? Or um, if you want, um, you could vote no action now, and then if something comes up. Where, um, say, like um, collective bargaining agreements, say there was something that was agreed upon between now and the end of the week, um, we'd let you know and then you could reconsider that. Although, but if you uh, vote um, no action on those three right now and nothing happens, then you won't have to meet again. Well, I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> Second. <laughs> yeah. So, if anybody wants to make a motion on Article 1, no Mr. action. Chairman. Amy? I move we vote no action on Article 1 in the Special Town Meeting Warrant. Second. We have a motion and a second to sure. vote no action in Article 1. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Go to the vote. Amy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Mike? Yes. Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Zach? Yes. Captain? Yes. And I'm a yes. That's unanimous. Article 2? Mr. Chairman. Amy? I move we vote no action on Article 2 in the Special Town Meeting Warrant. Bonnie, would you like to second it so the... Second? Min so sorry. Minute has leaving me hanging. <laughs> have a motion and a second to vote no action on Article 2 of the special town meeting. Uh, hearing no further discussion, go to the vote. Amy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Mike? Yes. 
Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Zach? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And I'm a yes. That's unanimous. Article 3. Mr. Chairman. Amy? I move that we vote no action on Article 3 on the special town meeting warrant. Second. Motion and a second to vote no action on Article 3 of the special town meeting. Um, hearing no further discussion, then to the vote. Amy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Barney? Yes. Mike? Yes. Peter? Yes. Steve? Yes. Zach? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that's unanimous. Okay. So, Mike, unless something changes by Friday, um, and we're, we're good to go for Saturday the 29th. Yep. And if something changes, you'd have to meet on Wednesday, obviously, for 48 hours notice. Wednesday. What Wednesday? The next Wednesday. Um, yeah. The okay. Wednesday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Right. Um, I don't have uh, my minutes done from oh gosh, beginning of July. Hope I put the date down because I haven't even written them yet. Um, I don't know if there's any further uh, items that we need to discuss? Mr. Chairman? Bonnie? Uh, I did attend the Permanent Building Committee meeting earlier this evening, but I'm happy to wait till the next meeting to give an update to the board. I can do it now if you'd like. And it be done in uh, under 30 seconds. I, I think I need 35. I'm sorry. I, 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 can I unsecond something? <laughs> what are you I'm trying just to offering. I don't want to withhold information. It's extremely important. Uh, you know, I'm I'm good waiting unless it's the earth shadowing is that I need to know. I would not say earth shattering no. Yeah. And I'm 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 okay waiting. I don't know about anybody else. I'll take it as we can wait. But thank you. Is it on uh, Facebook? Because I get all my information from social media. <laughs> <laughs> it will be when Peter posts his uh, summary. <laughs> Bonnie's going to send out a Norton alert. Oh, my Actually, God. my middle name, Bonnie Norton alert. Yes, I get it. Or the Peter Channel. <laughs> Who was that? That was Zach. Zach, yes. In 30 seconds or less, can anybody give us newbies a crash course to where we are on the budget process? We know that uh, for the late budget was passed at the town meeting, and you were waiting on some figures for the state um, to see where we are. Have those come in? Anything changed at the town meeting? Uh, it is no. From from what I understand, nothing has changed. So it last I heard, the state itself hasn't figured out the budget. Okay. So you know we're we're kind of running on a a best guess um, budget that we put together. But I, I believe as, as this whole pandemic just won't go away, 
is making it a little little more difficult for for the state to figure out you know where they stand. So until they do their thing, we're not going to know really how good or how bad the budget we have really is. And, and I, I truly think we may not know that until pretty deep into September or approaching the October fall meeting. That, I thought the state said they're a good, you know, three, four months before they get their act together. So, that's the last time for Mr. Chairman? Um, Aaron? I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Third. <laughs> Can you do that? I uh, it, have, a, have a motion and a second to adjourn for the evening. Um, I'm not hearing any further discussion on this topic. So we can go for the vote. Amy. Yes. Aaron. Yes, please. Bonnie. Yes. Mike. Yes. Peter. Yes. Steve. Yes. Zach. Yes. Kevin. Yes. And I'm a yes. So thank you all for uh, making it tonight, and I'll be in contact if we need to um, connect again. Uh, you know, if Mike reaches out to me. Um, otherwise, I'll see whomever at the town meeting, and then you know, come early September we will reorganize the the committee. Thank you, um, Bill. So have a have a great rest of the summer if we don't talk again. Good night everybody. Yeah, good night everybody. Good night. Good night, good night everyone.